Hey guys, welcome to SketchUp Live. Oops, my microphone's not on. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it was on. It wasn't on me. It was. It was over there. So anyhow, now we're back. Now we're. How's everybody doing out there? Sorry for any bumping or rustling noises this is making. All right, there we go. Yeah, I'm pretty good at putting that on now. Hope everybody's doing good out there. Uh, I know we had a couple people ask a couple of questions. That's awesome. Let's get a let's get started here. Get a head start on it. Um, oh, head start. We will. <laughs> Oh, I thought someone was asking if they could borrow an air compressor, Chuck. Oh, no, I was playing with it because I'm, I'm in the garage, and that's one of the things I have nearby to play with. <laughs> it's your fidget spinner. That's right. Uh, yeah, I've got some of those. Yeah, that's just a thing. There it is. Uh, hope you guys are all doing well out there. Hope everything's going good. Um, Tricky 2K thinks one of us is too quiet. I'm not sure which one of us. Um, let me look levels. You, you sound loud to me. Or you sound the same level you always are. I sound the same to me no matter what. So, ooh, that was, I got a little, I got a little yellow on that last one. Apologize if that, uh, if that blew up in anybody's ears. All right. Um... I'm having a issue right now. There we go. Get rid of it. Yeah. Uh, now you're now you're quiet again. Yeah. Sorry. That was a technical kind of an issue. But let's roll. How about that? All right, guys. Welcome. Welcome back. If you're if you're returning, welcome back. If you have never been here before, then just welcome. My name is Aaron. Uh, with me on comments is my buddy Jody. Hey, I'm on comments and common. <laughs> I thought you were just hanging me out to dry there. You're like, watch this. They won't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Let's play the quiet game for this whole session. That will be so funny. All right. Uh, welcome. It's, it's Monday noon. Well, it's afternoon. Well, no, it's exactly noon right now. So it's Monday noon here in Boulder, Colorado. Welcome. And uh, I hope everything's going well where you are. Hopefully everybody is staying safe, sheltering at home still. I got called out because I've been using the term quarantine. And uh, somebody mentioned that you really only quarantine when you're actually sick. Ooh. If you're just staying out of the public, you're sheltering at home. So excuse me if, if I have for my misuse of the term quarantine. Well, um, at least you use the word axis right and axes right. Oh, geez. I've been working on it. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see if I've gotten any better. I don't know what ha what will happen today. Um, COVID free is the way to be. James on YouTube is calling out. I like it. Um, so today we are doing our our normal month. What, what has become now our normal Monday thing of Q and A. So we want to hear your questions on SketchUp, and uh, I can't say that. We'll cover everything, but we've been trying to do our best to cover all the questions as they come in. I did, as per usual, set up a, a little Q&A session topic in our forums. If you go to forums.sketchup.com, great place to get questions answered on a normal day, but today it's extra special because we're doing this Q&A. And uh, if you want to share a file or example of something you're trying to model, something like that, that's the place to put it because I will be able to get to it right there. I also wanted to announce we just literally just started this this morning and we're doing a new contest. Uh, it is an opportunity for you to show us your SketchUp chops. So up on the forum right here we have a link to a file in 3D Warehouse and it's just a super simple basic outline of what could be considered a house or a structure of some sort. If you go download this, take this file, customize it however you see fit. You want to make it into uh, an underwater laboratory or a very nice residential home 
or whatever. You go take this file as it exists right now and customize it however you want. The goal is we want, we want something that's uh, visually identifiable still. We still want to be able to say that this is the same shape we started with, but you get to go in and make it something new. So we're doing this, this, this is more of a, uh, an opportunity for us to spend some time together during this shelter at home period. Nah, see, quarantine still sounds better. I don't know. Anyhow. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> this is an opportunity for you to, to uh, hang out with SketchUp while you do this. So we're not going to, it's not going to be like a, a hard deadline, have this in by, you know, next Thursday, midnight or anything like that. We're just going to kind of keep this running and keep checking out models as they go up. So the, the link to the model plus the rules are in this one right here. It's called Finish This House Contest. Once you get done, you will take your model, post it to 3D Warehouse, and then go to, there's a link to this house entry topic in the gallery. If you go to that topic, you'll actually be able to post your entries. So what we'll do is every Friday, we'll just cruise through this entry thread and we will check out the different people who have entered. If we get a couple that we really like, we're really impressed by, uh, the SketchUp team, that'd be Jody and me, you guys don't have to do this part, we'll take care of it. We'll actually reach out and see if they wanna join us and, and chat with us during some portion of the live stream. So that'll be kind of fun. Um, so yeah, so that's what's going on. So check it out. Like I said, it's, it's pretty casual. There's not a, a bunch of hard, ridiculous, scary rules or anything like that. It's a fun thing to do. Uh, get in there's there. There's eight rules here. I see eight rules. That's kind of scary. Well, there's eight rules. And then if you scroll down, there is a, oh, holy a, cow. an additional wall of FAQ. So we try to you snip. Think, you think I'm made out of time? We try to nip it in the bud a little bit, you know, get ahead of those questions. So we have okay. to wait for responses. <laughs> but yeah, so check that out. Uh, that'll be a fun one. And like I said, it's it's not real high pressure. There's not uh, not a whole lot on the line, just uh, a fun way to hang out together and uh, work on something together. Maybe what we'll do is like, not this Friday, but ne maybe next Friday or the Friday after. We'll see how it goes. Once it starts kind of dying down, people are submitting less. Maybe we'll, we'll spend one of the Fridays customizing one together. We'll get ideas from you guys, and I'll go in and throw some stuff in there. We'll have to figure out how to do a poll before then. All right. So let's, let's do some stuff. So we did have a question come in at the very beginning, and I know we're already like a couple pages of questions down at this point. But somebody did have a question about round, making round corners on something. So I'm going to touch on that real quick. So there's three pieces to this answer. And these, these link back directly to some skill builders I did recently. Um, if I just do something like a regular old rectangle, I'm just going to draw a rectangle on the ground right here. I'm going to use push-pull to pull it up. Obviously, everything is 90 degree angle, so it all came in square like that. If I take this geometry right here and I round off a corner first, like maybe I'll come in here and put an arc on here. When I push pull this geometry, <clears throat> excuse me, or if I use follow me, that will be rounded over. So you can see that I can actually use my modifier key with my erase to get rid of this line and I can have a geometry. So if I'm pushing geometry, the easiest way to do that is to start with it. Get it first, get it, get it fixed, you know, so I don't have an issue with that. From there, let's say I want to round over this top corner, I can do something very similar where I can come in and put in an arc like that. And then I'll grab this shape right here, say follow me with this little arc, and that will round off the edges. Again, it's not going to automatically hide this line right here. I do have to come in and either option or control on Windows, erase, or I can triple click this geometry, soften and smooth, and turn on soften coplanar and that'll get rid of those extra lines. So that is my short answer to how to round over. If you want to go beyond that, you're going to check out uh, an extension like round corner. No, I'm sorry. It's called, the new one's called Fredo corner from Fredo six. Fredo corner is kind of an amazing extension where it grab, you can grab as much geometry as you want and tell it how big of a round corner or what kind of a round corner you want to put on it and it'll go through and just soften all your corners at once. The other option, depending on what you're actually looking for, if all I want is the appearance of a round corner, then I can do that command I used before where I grab my eraser, hold on the modifier key. The modifier key is listed at the bottom. So down here I have option, because I'm on Mac, to smoothen, to soften or smooth. I believe 
it is uh, control on Windows. And if I just drag that over this line right here, it goes away and I get the appearance of a soft corner. If I'm exporting this file, if I'm taking this file and like uh, exporting it as an OBJ or an STL file or something like that, that is still there. That, that corner is still there. It's still a 90 degree corner. But as long as I have it softened in SketchUp, it's going to treat it like it's a soft corner and light it appropriately. So not a simple question where there's just a button that says round this corner. It's actually a couple different options depending on what you are actually s s trying to get out of the final model. So yeah, there you go. Thanks. Wow. That was a lot. There's not as many questions as you as you thought there might have been. No. A lot of these people are just checking in to say, hey. Hey. So hey, hey back at him. Hey uh, so I'm once a, one, in, one of these one of these later in the day. Uh, right. And someone was having problems installing extensions, both mm. of which are not necessarily Q and A questions, but uh, someone um. wants you to do a car. Okay. Can you do a three minute car? <laughs> uh, someone was asking about doing parametric design, which we've kind of already sussed that out in the chat already, nice. actually. Nice job, y'all. You know, and that's, I, I'm just going to make this, I'm going to do this quick shout out. I promise I'll keep it quick. But, well, I just got, I'm here. <laughs> you got what? I got real close to the camera and then forgot what I was going to say. I just want to say how <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I appreciate you guys who you guys in the chat who will, who will hop up and start helping and answering questions. I don't know if you know this or not, but that's not a common thing in a lot of software companies. A lot of software users don't uh, don't help each other out the way SketchUp users do, and I really appreciate that. That's a lot of we have a lot of selfless people who are out there to promote education, and and uh, that's really cool. So I appreciate you guys uh, knocking out questions like that. That's very cool. Oh, I do see a question that we can jump in, which is oh good. What's the best number of segments for a circle? That was I was going to say that one. Oh, great! Hey. I don't even need to be here. Great minds and oh, have, and ours. <laughs> so mm. I'm going to do I'm going to give you like three or four tips on circles, uh, and that's the best I can do really is a tip because there is no hard and fast rules, and here's why. All right, so first thing I will say is when you go to draw a circle, I'm going to draw it on the axes so we can actually see how I'm drawing this. But if I come in to draw a circle, when I first click circle, if I look down in the lower left corner, I got to get better at pointing the right way. Way down there, over there, it says 24 sides right now. So right now, when I draw a circle, it's going to have 24 sides. I'm just going to start with that and we'll come back to that. When I go to draw a circle, I click to the origin and I start dragging out. This is all simple stuff, right? You guys already know how to do this. What I will always recommend is that you drag out on an axis if at all possible. So if I'm on any kind of plane, draw it on axis. The reason for that is if I draw a circle now and then I draw another circle later, well, I can take this circle and I can directly line it up with this circle and my segments will actually line up perfectly if when I drew it, I had them both on the same axis. So even if, especially if I do stuff like one circle is 24 sides and one is 48, well, that can get real messy trying to align edges. But if I'm at least aligned to the axes where I drew it, then I at least have a hope of connecting everything back together. So that's, that's one thing. Always draw on axes. The other thing that I'll always recommend is always draw in number of sides divisible by four. So if I come in here and I go to draw a circle, oh, generally. So 24, if I do that, the nice thing is, look at this, I have a point on the green axis I can bring to the center, I have a point on the red axis I can bring to the center, and then I have one, two, three, four, five, six edges. Each quadrant then has exactly six edges. Very simple, very nice way to do it. Um, if you have something specific you're drawing, as I say this, I remember the last time we did uh, I don't even remember what it was now. We did something that had 13 sides based on ge geometry we were copying. Columns. So, what was that? Was it the columns stuff you mean? No, we did with columns. Different... Yeah, Those were it was all... 20 sides. No, I don't remember. Anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> Those were getting weird. That was cool. That was a thing. Right? It turned out pretty good in the end, but yeah, that was a. Yeah, no, I think, I think they were all divisible by four. Yeah, 
usually. So by doing that, you just you create uh, usable geometry. Because if I do come in here and I say uh, I want to do 25 sides, right? I'm going to draw a circle, 25, enter, and I'll pull this across to here. All right. So right now I have a snap point right here on the red axis. This one goes straight up, hits. I don't even know what portion of that line it's hitting. This one's going to hit in the middle of the line. This one's going to drop down to, again, some spot on that segment that I don't know what percentage or portion that is. So I end up with these weird, none of these sides actually. So if I was to take this one, watch this. I'm going to option and copy it around to this side right here. And look at this pattern I made by doing that. Not good. It makes for messes when I try to align circles. So uh, always draw in divisions of four. Saying all that, now I can get back to your actual initial question, which is what is the perfect number of sides? And I know some people really like hard and fast rules for everything. <laughs> and it seems like in computer software, you should have a lot of absolute rules. But in a creative software like SketchUp, we try not to, uh, you know, lock ourselves in with too many rules. So it really depends on what you're doing. So if you so are... Uh -huh. So would you call them slow, soft rules? That's right. Or soft and slow rules? As opposed to hard and hard fast? That's right. Keep it soft and slow. Right. Slow right. and low. So it really depends on what you're doing. If the circle is going to be huge, if I'm drawing uh, my, the outline of a stadium, then I might do something like 400 sides. If I'm drawing something like a pen that's going to be sitting on a desk, then maybe I'll only use like eight sides and just soften it. Um, if you're creating an STL file, you're going to export and 3D print. Then maybe you want to go to something like 96 sides. If it's a tire on a car that's in the background, maybe you'll go to 24 sides. So it really depends on what you're going to use it for. What you don't want to do, and this, this is probably as close as I'll come to a, a rule, is don't use more geometry just because it makes a smoother circle. So I know some people, I, you can do 999 sides, I think, on a circle. Um, some people will do that thinking that, oh, that's going to get me the best circle. Well, it's not. You're creating thousands of pieces of geometry every time you do that, and it's, it adds up. So you're, you're drawing. So if I draw a pen that sits on the table where the barrel of the pen and the tip and the end are all separate circles, and they're 1,000 sides each, and then each of those sides is... A thousand edges, then a thousand surfaces. I have two thousand elements right there. All of a sudden, that adds up, and my pen weighs like ten thousand polygons. So, I said it's it's not the perfect answer. No, it's not an open and shut uh, issue, but uh, you want to create the right number of sides for the thing that you're using. I've always advised never going above a hundred, and a hundred is the extreme extent mm -hmm. of what really is even useful. Yeah, like I said, 96 would be like if I was printing like a cup, like I, I wanted to print a, a pencil cup or something like that, I would probably put that in as 96 because that will get me, uh, you know, it'll be fairly smooth in the print and uh, it's not going to be super heavy. But that's probably as big as I would go to. Yeah, I agree. Like I said, the, the extreme example would be like a footprint, a circle the size of a city block. There I might go past 96. But I don't know, I, not, not, not often, because it's just too much geometry too quick. Okay, so Good we've question. got a, a bunch of people coming in with, uh, I want to work on, I'm trying to make X, and can you tell me how to get started? So some examples that we've got here yeah. are, uh, James is making a, designing an RC craft with his daughter, and wants some ideas on where you think they should start. Or Vinkat Maver is creating a small drawer design for an SUV, SUV, like something you can put in the back. And he's looking for ideas on how to get started. Well, I think if you, where I would go with those two specific questions, because they're, they're similar in that it sounds like you're creating something that will exist in the real world. So it's not, this is, I mean, a lot of times you do it, but this is something that is, is being, uh, drawn in SketchUp in order to figure out how to make it in the real world. Whether you're 3D printing or you're going to be cutting materials to work off of uh, that model, something like that. If you're doing that, 
then the first piece you want to come down to is is the actual materials you're working with right because you're going to design for uh if you're going to be making a drawer and i'm sorry I'm, i have these own pictures images of what you're talking about when you say you're going to make a drawer for uh what was it a drawer for the back for like of, a bed of a truck or for a oh. or an suv okay yeah so yeah it's basically so, just a it's a box with a drawer you can slide out Right, so if you're, what are you going to make it out of? Is it going to be something where you're going to fabricate it from steel, or are you going to cut it out of half-inch plywood? Start with that. Start well, with I'm, your actual material. Having having considered this for doing this for my Jeep, I mm -hmm. have a pretty good idea of what he's wanting to do. And yeah, usually people will do something with plywood in a case like this, since you basically, it's designing a box. Boxes are awesome because. <laughs> They're easy. <laughs> they're, they're pretty straightforward. So here's, I will give you this, uh, I, just a couple minutes, like like a real quick rundown on, on what I have done with this. I made a, uh, a table that fit into an odd space. It was actually triangular. And uh, my goal was to make it out of a, I think I made it out of a quarter sheet of plywood. So what I did was I started with, here's, here's what I had. So I had a, uh, two foot by four foot. So I started with this. Okay, so I created a group and then I started creating the shapes I wanted to cut out of this material on here to see if I could fit it all into one piece. So if you're, if you're making a, you know, something that is a specific size, um, start pulling those off of material. Cause that's one of the cool things you can do here that you can't do with real material is I can start moving pieces that I'm gonna cut around and see if I can cut, can I cut this all out of one four by eight sheet? Or am I gonna to have to go in and get a second sheet or one and a half sheets? Uh, and you can do that. And that's, that's where I would start is, is model your constraints. So the bed of your pickup, what is, what is the absolute, uh, you know, what is that shape gonna look like? What's the widening, what's the width, what's the height? Model that first, then start filling it in and then keep track of those shapes that you're gonna actually wanna build on the material you're cutting it from. If you're doing something that's going to be smaller, like uh, I think you said RC something, a lot of a lot of time, a lot of RC uh, users end up 3D printing their parts. Um, then make sure you're modeling in such a way that you're modeling for 3D printing. So that means modeling solids. Uh, that means modeling with wall thickness. So whatever the thickness of you know that material accounts for something. I can't just create a. I I couldn't take this and 3D print it because it has zero depth. But if I can print it to, you know, I want to keep my walls 1 16th of an inch, then model everything at 1 16th of an inch and go from there. So modeling for the real world is a little different. You have more constraints than if you're just modeling for fun or modeling for an image. But uh, that would be the big yeah, thing. Well, so it, it, it had said it was for a science project, but if it's actually building one that will fly, I guess you need to figure out what the parts are, right? And yeah. just make the parts. Yeah. But it's cool because, like I said, that's... Uh, uh, SketchUp ends up being kind of a cool scratch pad for those kind of models where you can start, how is this going to fit or what, what pieces do I have to have? So if I'm making a, you know, I need to have a, a battery that's this size and then I have this motor, which is going to take up this much space and I can actually start putting those pieces that I have to have, much like, like I said, if you're building a drawer for a truck bed, model the truck bed first and then I can start filling out from there. So yeah, that's, uh, that, that would be kind of my thoughts would be to tackle those practical ideas and then work backwards into your final design. So Jessica Lightbody on Facebook is, has got a question that you probably could speak to. We've all, we all, we all, everybody uses SketchUp and has done so for multiple years, has encountered the issue that whenever you upgrade to a new version, all of your saved materials and layout templates uh, disappear in your new version or they don't migrate to your new version. So maybe there's not much you can do to why does that happen, but you could at least kind of talk about the process of migrating your old yeah. stuff, your new you system. Know, <laughs> it's funny because, I, so I, obviously we get, uh, you know, I always try to show the most recent release version. Uh, so as soon as a new version comes out, I switch over to it. And I generally, and I know I'm not alone in this because I've talked to some other people who said, who backed me up on this. 
I see moving to a new version as an opportunity to purge. <laughs> I'm like a pack rat where I start to get more and more stuff. I get more templates built out. I have all this imported material and I don't always want all of it. So I personally am kind of relieved that it doesn't just automatically grab it. Um, we do have, I saw Colin was on. Um, Colin, I believe, can link us to, uh, I think there's a help desk article or something that will show us, that, that gives the location of the files. Because everything that's saved in SketchUp is saved into a file somewhere. So you can bring well, over. Well, we do. We have an article, actually, in the Help Center. It's all about oh, migrating between versions. There. So Jody can actually link to it. And then it'll just show if you want to grab your files and move your material files over, for example, how do you do that? Um, some More and more stuff is coming over automatically. Shortcuts migrate now. Um, what else comes over now in the newest version or since 2019? I don't remember, but there's, there's uh, a handful. I don't, I don't remember either. Um, but, um, uh, good. Okay, so Dimitri was wanting to import STL files and configure them and doesn't know where to start with that. Oh, yikes. I will tell you exactly um, what you should do. You should go get the extension Skimp. S-K-I-M-P from Mindsight Studios. STL files are great, um, and they're, they're kind of a general purpose 3D file because it's triangulated. So it's just every, every face is a three-sided and it's all connected together. The problem is they get incredibly heavy and they support very, very, very small geometry. So uh, when you import them, we had a, a coworker who was just actually talking about this last week about these files he was importing. They were showing up with holes in the mesh and they weren't importing right. And, Check out Skimp. Skimp will help simplify or reduce polygons because they're not so heavy. Uh, it'll actually run on import too. One of the things that happens with big, dense meshes like that is you go file import and then SketchUp just sits there processing, 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 and people get tired of waiting and force quit SketchUp, whatever. Skimp actually runs on import. So before it starts drawing in SketchUp, it pulls in the geometry and looks at it and says, how should we optimize this to pull it in the SketchUp? So you can actually tell it Take that geometry, but only import 5,000 faces out of it. And it'll run through and systematically combine faces and recreate a mesh that it can pull into SketchUp. So check out Skimp. That would be my, my absolute first thing. Um, the other thing is JHS Power Bar has a face finder extension that lets you take a section of geometry with holes in it, which is what happens with SK, or, um, I'm sorry, STL files come in is they have these little teeny holes that are smaller than one one thousandth of an inch or ten thousandth of an inch, whatever is the smallest geometry that SketchUp will draw, and it can't fill them in. So you end up with these little tiny speckles of holes in your mesh, and JHS Power Bar will actually help you seal those up. So I would check out those two extensions if you're going to be importing a lot of STL files. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. Hey, that's what I'm here for. Okay, so I got two of them in a row here. Um, I guess I'll switch between the two. So Saeed is actually using, he, he creates or he's printing templates for furniture making, mm. but they're all from AutoCAD. And he wants to start doing that in layout, but he's stuck trying to figure out create, how to create a, like a good template for furniture making. It's a layout question. Okay. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fuzzy on how to do it. I did, I did an ex, I did a video for this. Jody, you might be able to find it if I give you enough hints on uh, creating templates that you could automatically populate inside of layout. Um, it was the sneak peek video for Aaron Farr's uh, presentation for Basecamp 2018. I, so I interpreted that differently. Oh. Not so much page layout, not like a template for, I could be wrong, but so there's two types of two ways to view templates, right? One of them is this is the layout of what your layout document is going to look like. Mm -hmm. The other one is literally a template that you might print out and uh, glue on something and cut it out. But I don't, I'm not sure now. Maybe we need a, a clarification on his part. <laughs> um, but I'll at the in the interim, I'll at least find the the link to the creating templates. It's. Do you remember how long ago you did it? Uh, it was probably within the last year and a half. If you look up 3D Basecamp Aaron Farr, it should oh, okay. be there. Um, um, 
So an easy one while you're doing that, Manuel is actually, he's created a scale figure and he wants to get it into his default template and it doesn't say anywhere how to do that. Easy enough. Here's what you're going to do. Go to File, New, starting a brand new template. Make sure everything is set up the way you want to. So this is an opportunity to go into uh, Model Info, Units, and if you want to make changes here, something like that, if you want to change your line types and turn off profiles or change your background color. Anything you want like that is going to be your first thing. Go get that set up. Then, simple enough, I'm going to come, I don't have mine, so I'm just going to come over here to components and uh, let's look for people and I'm going to swap out uh, Laura here for, oh, this creep. All right, come here, creepy guy. I'm going to put him right there, and now I want that to be my new template. All I have to do then is go to File, hit Save as Template. SketchUp templates are just SketchUp files. So everything that's in a regular SketchUp file is in a template also. So when I say Save as Template, I'm going to be prompted what I want to call this. I'm going to call this my Creepy Guy template. And do I want to set it as my default out of the option there? I'm not going to do that, but you could. If Again, if this is you showing up and you want to show up every time, you could turn that on and hit save. Then, whenever you go to create a new file, you have the option of new, which is going to launch your default template, or new from template. New from template will allow you to go in and choose from the default templates, or click over to my templates and pick the file you want to start a new file from. Just that easy. I think there's something about templates. I think. I think there's a thing that happened because of uh, various softwares like the Microsoft suite where we got this idea that templates were like something sacred that you had to work with a certain way, but we try to keep it real simple. Template is just an empty SketchUp file. Create it, save it, and open anytime. So, so try to keep it easy. Um, and some of these long ones, I have a hard time going through. I think probably what I'm going to have to start doing with these is every so often I'm just going to scroll forward to present time and people have to and just tell people to re-ask questions because <laughs> sometimes you can be long-winded and all of a sudden 40 questions go by Yeah. and I'm scrolling through everybody else's rebuttals and answers to that stuff. Um, so... We get this question periodically from different streams other than YouTube, since a lot of our questions come there, that you can, can you ask the question from any of the streams? And yeah, yep. if you're here, if you can hear Aaron talk and you can ask a question and we'll try and get it in front of them. Uh, yeah. Is there, this one? I, I will say, uh, just, just to add to that, um, we do keep an eye on the, the different platforms. Um, we don't, like once this gets published, we don't go back into old Facebook posts and watch comments quite as much just because it's not as easy. If you go into a YouTube video and ask a comment, we'll see that comment no matter what. If you go into our forum, good chance that we'll catch one of those, especially if you put it into a live stream uh, topic. If you post onto like Instagram or Facebook, uh, there's a good chance that we might not catch that if you're, if you're unless it's on the like most current post. So, uh, but we, we do try to keep an eye on all of it, but I would say if you really want to get an idea to us or something like that, either go to the forum or to YouTube. Those are the spots we keep an eye on the best. Uh, so Cold77 was asking if there was a way, if there's a plugin or a way to trace a PDF uh, text 2D image so that it could be extracted in 3D, which I would think if you've got the, if you've got the font on your system, you could actually just use 3D text, right? Well, the problem is text doesn't come into SketchUp as text in most formats. Um, so I don't know of anything that, that traces text automatically. I th I'm guessing that's what you're looking for is I got text in a PDF file. I want to import the PDF file and have it automatically convert the text into SketchUp text, uh, which... I don't know of anything that does that. In fact, to get text to show up, depending on the file format you're, you're bringing in, you have to explode the text so it's not text, so it's actually lines. Um, but yeah, I don't know of anything that does it automatically. 
I'm, I'm thinking through that. I know. Yeah. Do you feel capable of explaining the difference between a classic license and a subscription, the subscription model now? Sure. <laughs> a classic license. What's the difference? <laughs> A classic license allows you to purchase a copy of the software. And that software is yours that year. If I, if I buy a copy of a classic license in 2020, I get SketchUp 2020 and I get to use it forever and ever and ever as long as my operating system allows it to keep running. We can't future-proof classic licenses. So we already have some versions of SketchUp that don't run on, most, uh, on, on current operating systems. Not Not... That's not an absolute statement. Some people have done stuff to get them to run, but uh, that's one of the limitations of a classic license is you have it, but you have it forever. A subscription allows you to, as long as you're subscribed, you keep paying, you get to use whatever the most recent version is. So that's kind of, a, that's our, our solution to future proofing is as we're seeing uh, operating systems, Apple and uh, Microsoft are, are, making bigger, more and more changes, regular changes to their operating systems, it's getting harder and harder for us to support. Uh, and that's, that's one way to do it is by subscribing, you know that the software you have is always running on the most recent operating system. So that's the big difference. Uh, you own a copy, but it won't be up, or it's, it's not gonna get regularly updated, or you subscribe and you always have the most recent version. Is that a good nutshell? Does that work? Pretty good. Uh, I forgot what I was looking up Aaron Farr for, but you sure didn't set me up for how to spell any of those names. Sorry. E R I N P H P F. I found her. Okay. Uh, but what was it about? What was the uh, it was video about, about layout templates. I found the video, but it... okay. Okay. So, so Saeed was... did confirm actually what he wants something that he can print out and use for creating the shape of the furniture he's making. Okay. So like a like just a so say he document. say draw a well. I don't know if you've ever done this is, is so you say you design a chair leg mm -hmm. you print that thing out a full scale okay and then you and then you glue it onto a side of a piece of wood and you can take it to your bandsaw and you can cut it to that shape absolutely yeah so what i have done so this is this is what i and i've actually done this just recently it was not for furniture but let's say i wanted to So say this was the profile that I wanted to cut out. And this is this is big. This is what? Four feet. So this is going to go across multiple pieces of paper. So what I have done is create a scene like this where I'm looking straight down on it and then take that into layout. In layout then, I will pull in this model window and set it at one to one. Then what I did, and this was, this was what worked for me, was I took it inside my layout window. So maybe my layout window looked like this. I would hit print or save that as a page and then duplicate the page. On the next page, I would take that same model window but slide the leg down to there. Save that as a page or print it out. And then because this is four feet, if I was printing on 11, that means I had to do five segments. So I do each segment with the leg slightly slid down and then actually print that as a series of, of legs. Um, that, I found was the easiest and quickest way to do it. I know there's other things where I could use software, third-party software, possibly even printer drivers to take an oversized plot, like a C or a D size plot, and print poster style, where it'll take that one image and break it all apart into smaller pieces. Um, but for me, just making multiple pages in layout was the simplest solution. Hey, Dave. Uh, Dave Richards actually just, just showed up. <laughs> And if there's anybody that's familiar with that, that process. So I, when I do it, I usually, I don't even go to layout. I just do it from SketchUp because mm -hmm. you can print to, I mean, yeah, it's better to print from layout because layout is the 2D equivalent of SketchUp. Mm -hmm. But I often, I usually end up just doing a, a SketchUp file and printing it out. One of the big things. Uh, I'm sure Dave has. Yeah, Dave's got some go opinions. Ahead. I know. Yeah. Um, I know. <laughs> I think the reason I end up going to layout, the, the, the main reason is for vector line drawings. Just to get those nice crisp lines, I, as opposed to, you know, something like this, I may end up with slight jagged edges. Um, I just like that light, that, that one crisp line that I can get out of a vector drawing from layout. But either way, it works. 
Uh, so Cheese Sun or Cheese in 124 said, I spend a lot of time trying to place objects in my model. What's the best, me best method for getting it right? And is there an extension that might help with left, right, back, forward placement? Um, Colin already responded to point out that there are better options in SketchUp 2020, but you could probably elaborate. Yeah. So when you talk about placing things, I'm assuming bringing stuff in from the 3D warehouse or creating your own comp components and moving them through a model. So let's talk about that real quick. When you create a component, I'm trying to show the component and, <laughs> and not hide it behind anything. When you create a component, the axes is where it's actually be moved from. So when I, so if I create this into a component, I hit create, it's gonna show up in my component window. If I bring that in, I'm grabbing it by the location of that axis right there. So it's something to be conscious of when I go to place. If I'm gonna place this and this is supposed to sit in a corner by this point right here, then what I'd wanna do is, I'm gonna go ahead and explode this and make it a new component. When I make this component then, I wanna make sure I set the component axis back here. That way when I bring that new one in, I'm actually, whoops, placing it from that back corner. The other thing is if I grab a group or component and I hit move, when I first hover over it, I get these little dots. See those dots right there at the different corners? Including the back one, if I hover over the back one, then the whole thing goes to transparent, which makes it super easy to line up things like this. That is a SketchUp 2020 thing. Um, people ask a lot of times, and it is in one years, but about moving it forward, back, right. Um, when I do this, if I'm having a hard time lining up something that's not, not lining up perfect, what I will do is line up one axis at a time. So if I was having a hard time, say one of these to line up, but I couldn't for whatever reason get it lined up pr properly, what I would do is hit red axes to constrain to red and move axis. just to the red axis. Then, oh, it's all falling apart. <laughs> I'll hit green to align to just the green axis. And that's how I would set that up. That's how I would do it, is, is one piece at a time. There are a couple extensions that allow you to do things like nudge, which is like literally move along an axis at a certain uh, preset time or, or preset distance. I don't ever use those because if I'm modeling in 3D space and I want to move it to the right three inches, I'll click on it, start to move it right, and hit, hit three, enter. I don't, I personally can't think for wanting to model precisely where I'd ever want to just grab something and just nudge it over a little bit, especially if I want these two pieces to align. If this is not exactly three inches from here and I nudge this three inches, it's going to overlap like that. So I find that aligning with precision by moving from one snap point to another is better than that. So, I don't Yeah, I think nudge fun. sounds great on paper, but it's one of those that it's hard to translate. Anytime this discussion's come up with the team, everybody's always questioning what exactly a, a nudge increment is equal to mm -hmm. type of thing. Right. It's, I think it's going right, to come over questions from, it, co it comes back from like uh, Illustrator or vector design software. You can grab something, you can hit the arrow keys and it moves, or you hold on shift and it moves 10 times or whatever. And I get that, that, that works okay, but working in uh, a 2D graphic on paper space is very different from working in a full-scale 3D model. Well, yeah, because like when you're working in paper space, you've got an increment. You can move it one millimeter because that's what mm -hmm. one pip is on your, on your ruler. Right. Okay, so LiFi asked this a couple of times now. All right. Uh, and I'm going to repeat what I just said in text a minute ago, which is if you're going to ask a question, uh, Prepend the whole thing with at SketchUp so I can spot it. Uh, but right. LiFi said, could you please help me deeply, more deeply understand the orbit tool? Sometimes I can navigate in orbit and reach the, uh, the specific foreshortening very easily. So it could be this. Yes, let's. Well, I, think it's, I think it's all about the, the cursor, right? Right. So, so there, is, there is actually, I, 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 maybe some people jump over this, but there is actually a orbit command that you can enter. Orbit command is a little different from a lot of other tools because it's a temporary state. So if I'm, so say I'm in here and, and I go into, I go into push pull, right? And while I'm in push pull, I can go to camera and go to orbit and I can move. And when I hit escape, it'll go back into that push pull command. So orbit's a little different, just wanted to mention that. 
then other because other commands if I hit uh, escape I'll I'll leave the command I was in completely. Orbit is a temporary one where it, it suspends what you're working on and lets you go move your camera around. Uh, orbit is of course the same as the middle mouse button on your three button mouse. So if I click and hold down that middle wheel right there, then I can just do exactly what Orbit does. Now what Orbit's gonna do is it will, when you click, it's like you're grabbing a handle in 3D space and then you're spinning your model around that point. So uh, I, I'm assuming when you said Orbit, you're, you're putting together Orbit and Zoom. Um, they are always, almost always used together because if you scroll that same middle button, you'll zoom in and out. And that's where Joey was talking about the cursor is very important because the point that the cursor is over is what's going to be zoomed in on. Um, but that's not always true for orbit. So orbit's going to swing your whole model around. You can see that. So that can be kind of tough when I get in here super tight like this. Um, because, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember what my, my general tips are. Um, the nice thing about Orbit is, well, it's, again, I was grabbing it by, let me back up. I'm trying not to think about my 3D mouse over here is what's happening right now. <laughs> let, let me I miss get, you. Let me get one thing. Hold on. Let me, let me simplify this drawing. All right, so here I have a thing, and I want to spin around it. All right, so when I zoom in and out, it's always the tip, very tip of the mouse is what it zooms in on. So if I'm zoomed in on nothing, if I'm covering nothing right now, uh, it can be very difficult, especially once you get a more complex model for SketchUp to know what you're zooming in on if you're on nothing. So move over the thing you want to zoom in on. It's going to zoom in directly right over wherever that cursor is. Uh, Orbit works similarly in that what I will get... Actually, okay, so now I actually do want some more things now that I'm talking about this. Um, depending on how far in I'm zoomed on something, it's going to orbit different than if I'm zoomed way out. Uh, and it's, I hate to say this, but it's, it's orbiting is kind of one of those learned skills where the more you play with it, the better you're going to get. But it's very, it's important with zooming and orbiting, keep an eye on the cursor. Where is the cursor at? Uh, I've had a lot of people who do something like this, cursor's down the lower right corner, and they just start zooming, and they went, wait, what's going on? Where's my model going? Well, it's doing exactly what you're saying, because it's going down to where the cursor is. Um, so, yeah. The nice thing is that orbit's always available to you, uh, especially with a three-button mouse, and if you get used to it, man, I'd say it's, it's one of the easiest ways to move in 3D of any uh, software I've used uh, as far as, uh, you know, different ways to, to move around in 3D space. Especially once you get used to the middle mouse wheel. I mean, there's my ability to pan in orbit is so convenient. And I, I often find anything, anytime I'm doing something else in 3D, I'm always frustrated that I can't just easily do that. Um, yeah, and the question came up, where is the axis of rotation? I believe, and, and somebody who's smarter than I can jump in, I believe that orbit always rotates around the middle of your viewport. So that would be somewhere right around here uh, as I spin around. I think that's a true statement, but uh, like I said, I could be it lying. Sounds, it sounds good. I mean, at least it sounds believable, and that's all yeah, that matters. Right? It looks like that's what's happening because... This, this cube's in the middle of my screen. Well, now it's not because I moved my yeah. cursor, but there we go. Um, All right, so Kai is wondering, he said, when importing an object into a scene, is there an option to have it appear where it was saved instead of having to drag and drop it to a rough position? I... No, because if you imp when you talk about objects, I'm assuming we're talking about components, and components are imports based imported imported based on the local axes to that object. So it doesn't know where it was from zero unless, as part of that component, you save that axis. So when I look at these right here, so this one right here, if I double click into it, 
that's the axes. If I import that into another drawing, I'm going to be placing it by that point. If I want this one, I'm going to explode it. When I import this, I want to put it at the axes and have it be that far away. What I can do is when I go to make a component, I can say this is the axis for that. Doing that then means if I bring that in, I didn't do that right. Hold up. Oh, there we go. Now all my objects look the same. There we go. <laughs> Let me start doing some different objects. So the handle for placements right there, if I move that over the origin, it lines up, see like that, lines right up with the previous uh, piece. That can get messy though, because once that's placed, once I place that, let's get rid of that, and then I'll put that, that one back in. Once I place it, uh, it can be hard to deal with later on because the axis is offloading somewhere. And if you have the opportunity, what I would recommend is paste in place actually works. So I can say, copy all of these pieces. And if I go to file new, I can say, edit paste in place and it will put all those pieces in relative to the origin from the other model. So it depends on what you're going to do. If you're bringing in pieces from different models, it's always going to place it based on the axis that is in that one component, but you can paste in place to go from one model to another or to re-import geometry. So those are the, the, the options. So Game Tech on Twitch is wondering if you could do a, I mean, he's wanting something bigger than, than maybe you could do right now, but so he, he'd he like to see, and I think I agree it'd be worth doing a session or two using the web version. Uh, he's using SketchUp for web on his Raspberry Pi, and he can't seem to find a way to export to STL. So you can, you can try bringing up web and at least showing where that setting is, or we can just talk about it later. Yeah, I think I could probably do that. So let's go to all right. Let's see. Um, I'll go ahead and open a model I got on the web version. <laughs> it sounds like. Uh, some dogs online are uh, responding to your dog's commentary, Jody. <laughs> that, nice. So I'm curious, everywhere else in the uh, in the world, is anybody else getting this thing? Every night at 8 o'clock, they do this howl uh, where people go outside and howl. My dog completely goes bonkers every time, every time the howl starts, especially because some people in our neighborhoods also like to set off fireworks. Yeah, I guess celebrate appreciation by blowing things up is not too weird. All right, so I'm a little rusty here, but I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, I can take this file and I can <laughs> uh, export, and right here under direct download, I can go to PNG STL, and then uh, I have some other options for cloud-based uh, processing. But right here, STL file will let you download a local STL file of the geometry. So pretty simple. Um, I'm not sure though if that is in the free version or if that requires shop. Do you know that off the top of your head, Jody? I'm pretty sure that's always been part of the basic version of, of web, just okay. because that's, that's very much uh, I guess if you had a, a target audience for SketchUp Web, it's for DIYers and folks at home. Okay. And you go when you go with the the shop version, you start to get extra things like woodworking tools, the solids tools, and mm -hmm. and some stuff like that. When I say so, woodworking tools, I mean solid tools. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Dave just just confirmed it is available. So all I have to do is go up to where it says uh, where the little folder is, export STL. It's just that simple. Uh, Kai, Kai Bach was saying that NHS UK celebration is at 8 p.m. but once a week. What What is NHS, Kai? I'm just curious. I saw that pop up and I caught it out of the corner of my eye because I thought it was my high school. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I would imagine why you would celebrate Niwot High School over in the UK. So, 
Wow, I think you're underselling your high school. It was, it was something special. It put up with me for two whole years. National Health Service. <laughs> okay, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah, so and that's what this the howl here is supposed to be about is is yeah. honoring the those frontline workers. Uh, uh, that's pretty cool. So there's going to be it's going to be kind of a tricky answer. Ilgis was wanting to know if SketchUp's going to convert Ruby to C plus plus in the future. Not sure it would be handy, but you can quote me on this. That seems like when I say, <laughs> "Oh." <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think that's a conversion that would happen because all the people that are creating our plugins in Ruby are not going to learn C plus plus. Right. And you have a way if if you code in C plus plus rather than do the Ruby scripting, you can actually create. You can create full blown extensions at that point. Right. So I mean, we have two different paths for moder modifying SketchUp, and if you're using a compiled language like that, then you could just write your own. Just go and get our SDK, which I probably could go find for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, in just a second. I think Ruby is a very intentional selection because it's not super heavy, heady programming. It's it's fairly easy for a novice to pick up compared to something like C plus plus. But um, I, I, like I said, I, I don't I don't see uh, anybody choosing to replace Ruby. Ruby's kind of become our thing. We've kind of committed to it. So. Unless something happens like Ruby stops being supported by operating systems, I don't think that'll happen. But I'm just guessing. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't see it going away. I mean, you can leverage more than just Ruby through our API. You don't have to. Everything doesn't have to happen inside of Ruby. You can have a programming layer uh, deeper than Ruby, but uh, it's not a replacement for Ruby. Okay, so. So Derek on Facebook is wanting to know if there's any way to dictate line weights or line colors or workarounds for them in SketchUp. Um, so there is, we've, we kind of covered this, I think it's last Q and A session. We came up with, we looked into this uh, as far as styles inside of SketchUp, you really only have the ability to turn profiles on and off. So with that off, I just get my single pixel uh, default edges right here. Um, but I can choose to color lines by choosing by material, wherein I can come in here and I can say, we'll go into this, this piece right here. I'm going to select only edges and then I will make them red. So I can do that. I can, I can choose to color individual geometry. Um, I can also, of course, put things on tags and then change the line types. Uh, but scale, if you want to go in and make, make lines different scales based on tags or whatever, uh, that's where you got to use layout because um, it does just uh, do that single pixel line unless it's a profile. Good question. Uh, so Sashi on YouTube is wanting to know how to grip an X or Y or Z axis on your keyboard, which I think probably just means locking an inference, but. Right. So if I go to, if I'm moving this right now, wherever I click, I can move anywhere, but that's where the keyboard comes in. So right down here, you can, you kind of see it on the overhead, but here I have a little green arrow on my left, red arrow on my right, blue on the up and magenta on the down. And let's just tap that, hit the left arrow key. And now I can only move on the green axes, right arrow key only on red. And then of course, up arrow key is gonna constrain me to moving on the blue. So Bizwajit uh, is asking how well SketchUp can be used for BIM implementation. I'm not gonna rant. Yeah, <laughs> that's a can of worms. <laughs> okay, uh, it really comes down to what you're expecting from BIM. Um, some places have this more well-defined, uh, in the U S when we say BIM, it can mean something different to everybody. Some people, they hear the word BIM, they think 3d model. Some people say BIM, they think materials. Other people hear BIM and they're like, well, that means, uh, that there is a timeline on when materials be delivered to the site. <clears throat> so unfortunately I'm, I'm only phrasing, framing that question because how is BIM implemented really can depend on what you are expecting out of it. Um, 
within SketchUp, anytime I create a thing, anytime I create a component, I do have the ability to uh, fill in basic information here in Entity Info where I can create the instance definition. Uh, it automatically calculates volume. If I hit the little plus key at the bottom, I can use these values, price, size, URL, owner, status, or type. Type will allow me to use classification like IFC to actually tell it what this material is or what this item I have selected is. Likewise, I can go further and add additional data. If I right click, go to dynamic components and pull up component attributes. In here, I can actually create custom attributes. <clears throat> so I could say, uh, say I wanna, what, what phase is this gonna be part of? I could actually create a custom, custom attribute called phase and then put it in phase two. So that's the kind of BIM information that we can put into a SketchUp model. And that's just, that's just vanilla SketchUp. That's no extensions, that's just normal SketchUp can be put there. That data can then be accessed through reports um, or through uh, layout. You can actually access any, any of these, these flags through layout too. Um, that's what happens there. As Jody just happened to have been talking about extensions, people are building additional extensions on top of SketchUp that allow them to put all kinds of other information or access other information from inside SketchUp as well. So when we talk about BIM, a lot of times we come up with interoperability with other, other software packages, uh, and that's the kind of data that can then be wedged into a model using something like an extension. So uh, the short answer, which I'm already well past, is really it depends on what you're trying to get out of BIM. <laughs> Sorry. I just kept going. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna grab this question from Chris from 12 minutes ago, and then I'm gonna zoom to the bottom and start kind of working my way back from that again, just to catch back up. All right. uh, but he was asking how tags work. He said grouping components to create layer, and it, and it looks like the layers are no more. Right. Lag, they are. tags are layers. Uh, we got rid of the term. A lot of people were, sh were tripping up on the term layer, to be honest. Uh, it was one of the big issues. So layers comes from photo imaging software, like Photoshop, where layer means something. If this is layer zero, layer one sits in front of it. Layer two sits in front of that, and you build up layers. There aren't layers in 3D space because that's, that's, that's something that happens when you lay pieces down in 2D space. In 3D space, I can't say this is always in front of this because as soon as I spin around in 3D space, now this is in front of that, so a layer wouldn't make sense. So we came up with this more gen general term of tag, which just says basically it is a visibility tag. So if I grab these two pieces and I tag them as one, and then I grab these three pieces and I tag them as two, now I have the ability to come in here and turn one on or off, two on or off, and that's really what is important here is that those tags are visibility tags. So this could actually read visibility tag, um, but that's, that's what they are. So layers was a little misleading. We had for years and years, people said they wished that it was not called layers because layers confused them. So that was, that was the, uh, one of the motivating factors okay, in so changing that name. Okay, so both Andy on YouTube and Miles on Facebook have asked and it's possible someone else has as well. Uh, what the heck does your shirt say? Everybody's no. getting to only see the top two lines, and then the punchline is completely there we gone. Go. Sorry, it's a it's a long T-shirt. <laughs> it's it's commentary to my uh, struggle, my real world struggle with mathematics in general. It was from my wife. My wonderful <laughs> wife got me a T-shirt that told the whole world that I suck at math. <laughs> Which I own. I'm not, I'm advertising not, at this point. That's right. I own it. Uh, 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 okay. Well, so there's not, I'm not. I'm not that far behind. It just looks like That's I'm good. behind because everybody's talking. Yeah, I love it. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what Alex on YouTube is asking. He said, "I've seen someone frame a house on this platform, then going out and building it. What app is that? Now, that could be a joke. Like, I need an app that builds the thing that I just drew." <laughs> It, uh, it's possible. I can't think of what else he's... It's possible you're referring to John Brock and his extension estimator, 
for SketchUp. Um, the only other things I would think of is there's, there's actually some framing software. So, so here's a couple ways I would answer your question. One would be the Medique extensions, which go in and frame geometry. So they'll go in and put trusses in or wall framing, or he's actually working on concrete and electrical. So it actually automates the creation of the components to frame a structure. So that could be what you're talking, thinking of is Medique, M-E-D-E-E-K. Um, the other would be estimator for SketchUp. If you're talking about taking what's in a framed model and actually going out the field with a cut list or a materials list to make it, that would probably be estimator for SketchUp. So maybe one of those two. Okay, so this one is, it's a little tricky uh, and I advised him, well, I told him I would mention it, but also I think Dave might've already recommended also going to the forum, but Adam on YouTube uh, would like to see how to make a fully functioning toilet bowl where there are rim jets and a fully modeled trapway. He's having trouble modeling the whole thing. And I warned him that it's kind of bigger than a Q and A. I would love to see um, that too. <laughs> yeah. So I think probably the best place to go is go to the forum. You'll have to create a login and then create a post there asking the world what you be sure. So this, I'm going to do a little PSA here for the forum. Right. When you go and ask a question, always be sure to open with what you've already done. Because sometimes the community can be a little, they're a great community, but they can get a little cranky whenever you just come in and ask a question, seemingly only wanting them to give you the answer rather than showing that you've already done some of the, some of the legwork. Well, and, and so. asking a broad question like, how do I model all of a toilet bowl? Well, right. Yeah. So I mean, you need to need to be clear on what exactly your your pain point is. What have you done, and what's not working, or what's hard, yes. or what's got you stumped, and what reference you're working from. What do you What are you actually trying to do? Um, I, 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 it amazes me how often people come in, and I get, I get the context, but somebody comes in and goes, I'm really struggling, struggling on modeling this RJ45. And everybody's like, oh, <laughs> I don't know what that is. So if you have like a reference image of what you're trying to model and you can show what model you've created so far, like Jody's saying, that's going to go a long way. And that's going to probably get you a better answer rather than a bunch of questions asking you what you're talking about, what you're trying to model. So. Um, but my, 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 my thinking, having done some modeling like that is, uh, if you're, well, I guess, my, I guess if it, is it just the modeling for the sake of modeling? Cause if so, that's awesome and go for it. Um, if you're actually hoping to use this in something, then I would question how much of that detail do you actually need to put into a model? Um, I think. Robert Coolidge just commented on Facebook that most manufacturers already supply models too. So if you're interested, you can grab those. But man, I've seen some of those uh, manufacturer models of sinks and toilets, and they are dense. Uh, <laughs> well, because there ain't there ain't no straight. There's not a flat spot on the thing, and everything is is <sighs> all curvy. Man, and they're just th those models just have just super fine meshes and like I think like a million faces just for the toilet bowl. That's, that's crazy. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's another thing to think about. Yeah, I think that's probably several different problems to encounter on, on its own. First one is the, the actual toilet shape. And then the next one will be how to create the actual like working ductwork mm -hmm. or pipe work or whatever for the jets inside yeah. of that. So it's going to, it's going to, it's certainly not an easy thing to just jump right into. Right. Yeah. I think what we did, we did a live stream where we did a sink, bathtub and toilet. And, uh, we kind of did a, I call it very modern because <laughs> we, we ended up having a lot of slabs in the toilet as opposed to like being able to see the S curve and, or the U bend and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, it was a, uh, it's, that's a, it's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky set of geometry to get modeled right for sure. But yeah, my, my, uh, my, so question, my first Facebook. question back would be, what are you trying to get out of it? Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see. We'll see if he's got some responses. But in the in the meantime, uh, Manos is asking, how do you count an area of surface easily in square meters? Um, any any surface that exists, if you just pick on it, 
entity info will tell you the square measurement. And it's going to tell you the measurement based on your current units. So right now, mine is set to uh, show square feet. You can change that if you're looking for square meters. If you just go to window, model info, and into units, uh, right here, area, you can actually tell it what you want to see. So if I come in here uh, to decimal, I think I put, I could change this to square meters instead. And then it'll actually show me exactly how many square meters this is. And this works with multiple pieces too. So if I have multiple pieces of geometry, when I select them, it'll actually total them up. What you don't want to do is I don't want to have more than just surfaces selected because then it's not going to be able to figure out what you're trying to get. If I have just surfaces, regardless of the number, it'll tell me the square measurement of that based on the unit that you have selected for it. Uh, okay, so Ellis Humph Humphreys on YouTube said that they render retail retail display fixtures and show posters, graphics, standees, etc. They design the graphics and use Skagit to visualize the kits. So they're looking for best practices to import graphics. PNG, JPEG, PDF, what resolution? Um, so I always, I like PNGs personally. Now that I'm saying it, I don't really can't think of a reason why, but I, I just think they're better. <laughs> and like Mac over I PC. I think for me, it's no, just... No, I'm just kidding. I'm not trying to get into something I, like that. I'm just kidding. I think PNG is sort of like they take the best of GIF and the best of JPEG and they stick them into one format. So then I don't have to worry about right. caring about the other two. Right. Yeah, the less you have to care, the better. Um, so I would personally say a PNG. Um, and it, this, this gets tough because this falls into a, as good as you need. One of the things that can cause a SketchUp model to get big and unruly is having a lot of high resolution images imported. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you don't really need a super high resolution image inside of SketchUp because SketchUp's not a renderer. It's not gonna show photorealistic. It's gonna show uh, you know, a reasonable set of geometry. Um, so I would say, I mean, it's, if, if you, when you import into SketchUp, it's going to resize to 1024 anyhow. So if your images are already at 1024, then that would be a good size to import. If you're going to go larger than that, check out the large image splitter extension. And that's going to take your images and break them into pieces that are smaller. Um, but uh, yeah, I, don't, I guess I don't have a rule of thumb for how big they should be. I just think the biggest problem that people run into with imagery is they start importing huge like 4K images, uh, which you're not going to get that high a fidelity of imagery out of SketchUp anyhow. Um, and then they end up wondering why their models are running slow because they have those huge images in there. That image, as soon as you add an image to SketchUp, it's saved as part of the file. So you can bloat your file size immediately with huge images. So um, yeah, I, I would say stick to like, two, yeah, a, a couple thousand pixels at most when you import them. So if you use, if you use big image, large image splitter or whatever that thing mm -hmm. was called. It actually breaks it. it you, you, could use a, you can pull so in you a higher. You take something that's really big. Right. And, that's, and then but, it just makes several smaller. Right. It'll keep it as a single image, kind of, but still break it into smaller pieces so you get a higher resolution out of it. But one of the big things with that is, and a lot of this, when you say it, it sounds like common sense, but people get stuck on this all the time. Uh, choose what files you want to bring in as higher resolution wisely. So if you're bringing in a picture that is a, you know, I'm doing a storefront design and I have this big eight foot tall image that's going to go in my front window and it's a picture of the product I sell, well, that's cool. Make that a high resolution, bring that in, use large image splitter, get a good high resolution there. But don't bring in the, don't bring in a 4K image of a floor tile because you don't need to bloat your file with that because it doesn't have to be high resolution. We, I, I've honestly gone through models where people had image files that were as big as the rest of the SketchUp file of concrete. Just, just a chunk of concrete. So, 
it was it was it's crazy but uh yeah be be conscious of your 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 file weight as a <laughs> as it corresponds to the pixels and the images you import sorry that was a little bit of rambly but i didn't have a solid thought on that process yeah you could tell how definitive you felt by answering that question and how you rambled there yeah <laughs> okay so arthur on facebook sorry. said i want to know if there's a way you can assign endpoints assign the endpoint options under edge style to a shortcut on the windows oh I guess I hadn't read it fully in advance. I want to know if you can basically right, turn toggle. endpoints off and on with a shortcut. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I don't think you can. Because this is not a, uh, yeah, unfortunately, no. Um, editing styles is not uh, something you can get into shortcut keys with. It's possible that could be an extension. I don't know if anybody out there has ever looked into that, if that's available through the API. I don't know. Um, but it is possible you could have a toggle endpoints extension, but I don't know. Uh, John Brock said, thanks for the shout out. So apparently he's, he's here. He's watching. He's listening hey, to you. John. Don't say anything bad. Hope everything's going well with you and yours. Um, I don't know what Dave Johnson said to fill out the profile. I'm not sure what he means. Were we working on a profile thing? Oh, you were talking about posting to forums. And when you go into forums our forum, you will create a profile because we want to know who you are oh, when yeah, you yeah, post. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you create it, it's going to ask you things like, what version of SketchUp are you running? Uh, you probably know what they all are, Jody. I don't remember what they... But it's going to ask you some technical information about the, the system that you're running, that sort of thing. If you fill that out, then people who are in the know can look at your profile and head off some questions or issues you might be running into. So I think that's where that... I'm guessing that's where that came from. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that sounds right. Especially since it came from Dave Johnson. Uh, Derek asked this a while ago, but I think he missed the part where you did the coloring edges. Or did you do coloring edges when I you were doing edges. line weight stuff? Oh, no, I don't think he asked it. Oh. Okay. Uh, he asked if you could actually show to do that, show how to do that again. Sure. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually question. throw this out here too, uh, an extension uh, that I use like crazy. If you right click, you see I, I have down here an option which is select only. Um, so I can say select only edges. And that's actually an extension called Selection Toys from TomTom. It is available on Extension Warehouse. And that's gonna get me, so just my edges are, are selected right now. And now if I go into, uh, in here, grab a green color and I click on any of these lines, they'll all get changed to green. So if you are gonna go in and start coloring, it's way easier to color and mask like that where you select a bunch of lines rather than clicking individually because you do have to get on the pixel of the line uh, and that's where selection toys comes in. So I would make that uh, kind of part of that process is get selection toys if you want to do that. All right. Uh, okay, so Mushrif on YouTube said the biggest issue of not using SketchUp is unsolid objects. One object is mixed with another and cannot be separated as CAD directly makes solid objects. So I think there might be a little language barrier there, but it sounds like maybe he's bringing stuff in from CAD or whenever he's making things in SketchUp, his objects are merging and creating a non-solid object or non-solid geometry. Um, are you talking about uh, this? Maybe, or maybe he just wants everything to be solids, and they're not. Yeah, SketchUp is not a solid modeler. In... Um, it's a surface or polygon modeler. Um, so if that's what you're running into, that's that's correct. SketchUp doesn't automatically create extensions. Or, or I'm <laughs> Whoa. It does not automatically create solids. You do have to in intentionally make them, and what you have to do is grab geometry put it into a container like a group, at which point it becomes a solid. Also putting it inside of a group like that prevents that geometry from connecting to other geometry. So I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but uh, those were a couple of thoughts that came to my head when Joey read your question. Okay, AMK Structure asked if there are any tips for the paint tool or relating to paint in SketchUp. Um, Let's see, let's go look at it. You, so when I hit B for bucket, 
because that's the shortcut key. Um, there are modifier keys for SketchUp. A lot of people don't know about this, so I will touch on this real quick. Um, when I come in to paint right now, uh, it's ready to let me click on a surface and apply that color. Um, you do have options down here. If I hit hold down command, I'm on Mac, so my, my buttons will actually differ a little bit from what yours will. If you're on Windows, I think it's control as opposed to command. I don't remember what they are, but that will let me actually pick a color. So if I want to choose a color, this is picking a color out of SketchUp. This is different from coming over to the colors window, and this is different. This, there's slight difference in what I see on the screen for Mac and what shows up for Windows, but in both of them, there is an eyedropper icon there too. That is different from this modifier key uh, picker. So when I hit the modifier key, it says pick. So this color right here is white and this color right here is white. They're the same thing. If I click the eyedropper tool that's in the paint bucket UI, I get this sampler and this sampler is going to pick colors off the screen. So when the sampler, this white is different from this shadowed color, which is more of a gray color. So there's two eyedroppers. That's one thing to keep an eye on. The other thing is if I come in here to paint, I'm not sure why these don't show up, but there are other modifier keys. I forget what they are. Um, if I hit option, I think it's contiguous fill. So if I click on this white face, any white faces connected to it will get colored with the same color. Um, and then I forget what the shift one does. Something different. <laughs> I don't know. See how those little three separated boxes as opposed to option gives me the connected boxes? I thought that was cool. I used it for like, I used SketchUp for like eight years before I figured that out. I would normally go fill, fill, oops, fill, 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 spin, fill, fill. That's what I'd normally do. I didn't realize that all I had to do was hold down option and click and it would fill all those connected pieces together. Oh, man, not the brightest bulb in the chandelier well, sometimes, I tell you. Yeah, there's so there's, there, there's my thoughts. Spur of the moment, uh, paint bucket things. What else? Yeah, the, the help center article for that is like, it's huge. It's very yeah. long, surprisingly long. Hey, maybe we need to pull, make some uh, more videos out of that. May, maybe so. Uh, LT asked a two-part question. I'm just going to go ahead and get both of them in here. Uh, Ske is SketchUp a suitable tool to build 3D model of a building structure, a collapsible tent structure with joints is his example. And um, the structure is made of a planar geometry like a faceted jewel later to be transferred to others for engineering, pricing, and manufacturing. So it sounds like he's doing some project design or some prototyping. Which, yeah, the answer is yes, right? <laughs> it's very, <laughs> very yes. appropriate for something that's faceted with straight flat edges. Yeah, I mean, that geometry is perfect. Uh, that's where a, something like a surface modeler is ideal. Um, so, yeah, the, the short answer, like Joey said, I mean, he's kind of tongue in cheek, but yeah, SketchUp could be used for either of those. Um, the one piece where you might. native sketchup might not do everything you were hoping for is like like you're saying if you're doing like uh joints and that kind of things you want to see how how pieces are going to interact together uh thinking of like a, a accordioning shape or collapsible shape something like that sketchup doesn't natively support things like hinge points or anything like that where if i move one piece it's going to connect and move a different piece anything like that you can get into things like uh ms physics and then start creating joints and see how things will interact that's possible um, but SketchUp could absolutely be used for the product, this, the piece design. But uh, like I said, if th that's what I was thinking of. If I was designing a product that was like a collapsible tent, that's a bunch of joints interactively moving together, that would be beyond native SketchUp. That would be something additional you'd have to add on top. Uh, Christian on Facebook is asking, uh, do you, have an, do you have any other option to texture exactly the curve of a face? Because the projected is not totally applied specifically to the side of the curve. Um, put a label on a, a can of soup. Yeah. Yes, let's. All right. Let's say I want to... 
All right, let's make, let's make new geometry. All right. Um, let me go. Let's make an image real quick. Let's get a picture of Mark and I at WorkbenchCon. So I'm going to take a quick picture of that. All right, now I'm going to say that I want to wrap that right onto here. So we're going to do, we're going to do this a couple different ways. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I got to get that image in as a texture. So I'm going to say, actually, I'm just going to throw a piece of material on the ground, file import. We'll go to the desktop and grab that screenshot I just grabbed. Check my options. I want to import it as a texture. Import, and I'm just going to stick it on here for right now. All right, so that's the image I'll put on there. So right now, if I go to my paint bucket tool, I use the eyedropper to pick it, and then I apply it right here. This is what it starts looking like. So I got some issues there. Um, you know, here's what I'll do. I'm going to actually, we'll do this two ways. Okay. First way I will just apply it directly on. So obviously it doesn't look too bad, but it's not in the right spot. So what I have to do in this case is take this and I want to adjust where that texture is actually placed. The problem is I can't adjust a texture on a curved surface. What I'd have to do is turn on my hidden geometry and pick one facet. So I'll pick just this piece down here and I'll right click on it and say texture position. And now I can take my image and I can move it so that, where's the edge of this image? Here it is, right here. So I can say move this image so it's right there at the corner. And I can also right click, turn off my fixed pins so that I can come in here and I can shrink it down. Or raise it up. So there we go. So the edge of that image is right on the edge of that facet. Once I've done that, then it's just a matter of sampling that image and then pasting that. Uh-oh, that doesn't look right, does it? Hmm, oh, that's exciting. What happened? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so the problem I did there Okay, no, that should be right. Hold on. Well, this is exciting. I'm honestly confused about what is happening right now. Okay, there, that was, that's better, but not quite. Well, what I wanted to show was this. I'm going to take this thing right here. This is my first. <laughs> and it's just that simple. Hold up. Hold on. Everybody sit still for a second. All right. I'm going to take this, this texture right here. We're going to talk about projecting real quick first. I'm going to take this image and I'm going to move it so it is straight back behind this curved surface. And then I'm going to scale it so it's right about the same height. And what I can do with this is I can take this texture, I can make it a projected texture. What that means is that if I pick it, I can put it onto a curved surface and it'll actually wrap around that surface. Like I took this as fabric and put it onto there. If I take that texture now and I put it on here, see how it distorts as it wraps around? This is where applying to, oops, I got rid of my image now. Dang it, hold on. 
making a mess. I didn't have a, I wasn't prepared for this. Um, I'm gonna reapply that. This is odd. Um, yeah, that's not what it's supposed to do. I don't know. Well, another option. Is to position that texture. I don't like why I'm, why is this not working? So let me, let me position this texture again real quick. I'm gonna turn on my fix pins. I'm gonna drag this edge out like this. Actually, we'll pull that across like this a little bit. All right. Now, paint that on here. So weird. Huh. Maybe your computer has the coronavirus. You know, sometimes I just don't know what else it could possibly be. <laughs> That's supposed to work. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, but here's the other thing I was going to show because this is cool. Um, and this was actually be my, was where I was going to go with the solution because doing it that way that I was about to do it, is actually not that it's not awesome. It's, it's time consuming to have to paint each face. So I was gonna say, what you could do instead is grab a hold of this extension True Bend. What True Bend will let you do is take that surface, and this is after, so I already got the, the materials on it, so I'm going to make it a group, everything's good, and then I can grab True Bend, and I can take it, and I can actually just fold that to 180 degrees, That's happened. Well, everybody's got too. comments down here, and I, I was I was busy looking at old like eight minute old comments. Now I'm being all that for sleeping on the job. Uh, wow. Sebastian says sample one, copy to two; sample two, copy to three, etc. Are you doing that? No, thank you. Sometimes the brain should no function. There you go. There you go. Thanks, Sebastian. I, yeah, yeah, I probably apparently should. Apparently, didn't work at all, so forget that. All right, so let's try this one last time. I, I don't, I just don't remember. All right, so I'm going to grab this image. This is the image I liked. I'm going to grab that and paint it to this one. Right now, it's projected, so it's getting, it's smearing. So I'm going to grab it, toggle projected off. I'm going to pick it again and I'm gonna put it on here. And then this piece right here is where I'm gonna texture position and get it lined up exactly where I want it to be. So I want it to be like, just like that, showing the edge. Now I'm gonna say, sample this first piece and put it on the second piece. And then, whoop, I hit vertex tools. That was not what I wanted to do. All right, pick this one, paint it here. Pick this one, paint it here. Pick this one, paint it here. That's so funny. How many how many people were talking to me and I was busy staring at people 10 minutes. I was looking at reading everybody's comments from the past. Whew. And now everybody's, now Colin's starting to become a smart aleck. I'm going to kick him off, block him. Yes, that works. So those are the two ways to put it on a curved surface. This one's going to wrap it. The projected is going to take it and as if it was pushing it straight down onto the curve, that means it's going to, as it goes to the edges, it is going to start to distort. So it's, it's not too bad in this particular image, but you can see a little bit of distortion. See how this, this, this is supposed to be a square corner. It's getting pulled off into a point. That's this right here. It's getting stretched because it's going, getting stretched around that curve. So those would be the, uh, the, the quick answers. <laughs> quick, quick. On, uh, on how to do that. <laughs> The quick answer. I think that's. I think that was ten minutes long there. 
Oh man. Yeah. A little too much time in the garage. You know, actually, since we're paused, because I paused, I felt like I was doing really good. And then last week, this whole stay home for the last six weeks kind of feels like it caught up with me. Do you guys all experience that? I've heard more than one person say that they kind of hit their breaking point temporarily there. <laughs> yeah, that's what, yeah, I feel like I've bounced back, but that's, yeah, definitely how I was at the beginning of last week or the week before, I don't remember. I marked it off. Last Monday was our one month anniversary from the uh, forced, forced stay home. Yeah, it's, it's been quite a month. Uh, somebody, I saw a couple things go by calling out through paint. Through paint is an awesome extension. It will do very similar to projected, but I think it probably does a little bit uh, uh, even better job. So, yeah. Um, so there's sort of a, a dearth of, of like question questions that I can right. can really throw out here. But uh, Sebastian made the comment of if SketchUp did model rigs, he'd be in heaven. Now you've done some a little bit of modeling with your your stuff for your book. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a trick for creating sort of pseudo rigging? Um, I assume what you're talking about is, is rigging a, a character for 3D mo or for 3D for animation. Um, that's, and that's my presumption. Yeah, and I, I don't. Unfortunately, I mean SketchUp doesn't do rigging. It's it's pretty simple. Um, what I yeah. would recommend is you know creating creating your character in that zero, you know pose, legs slightly spread apart, arms out to the side, fingers spread, head facing forward. Uh, if you can create the geometry there and then export it to something that does rigging, that seems to be the best way to do it. Um, I have done a little bit of stuff with uh, robots and that kind of stuff where there's definite joints and actually made geometry that was like rotational points to, to rotate from. Other people have used MS physics to place those points in there to let uh, one component rotate off of another kind of thing, but it's not traditional rigging. And as far as I know, I haven't seen a rigging extension for SketchUp. So I think what ends up happening is most people create, if they're going to create those pieces, they either create them as, I said in the case of a robot where I have distinct separate parts, I'll create those, those pieces as uh, groups or components that can be exported and then compile them in a, the, your character creation software, or creating a model in, in that neutral pose and then taking that into something else to rig. But yeah, T pose. That was that's what it was. My brain wouldn't get it. A T pose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sebastian on YouTube helped me out there. Uh, that's an extension, or that's a model on 3D Warehouse. A T pose. It's just a general, a general pose that you could put a character into. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Because when I I looked it up just in relation to SketchUp, and there's a lot of people have actually created T pose models in the 3D Warehouse. Mm -hmm. Oh, question yeah. is of course how good are are any of those right there's there's actually there's a handful i it's like i try to watch because there's i don't know i love uh i love when people push software beyond what <laughs> you can't do organics in sketchup so one of my favorite things to look for is like people who've been creating sketchup and i don't know some of them probably been imported but uh there are some cool models of humans in in the sketchup uh 3d warehouse and some of them are higher uh, geometry, higher, heavier, higher polygon than others. Some of them are, are super, super simple, but they give you a good uh, base to work from. So uh, that, that's an option if you are creating characters to go grab a base model off of 3D Warehouse and build from that. So something's going on because whenever I type into live stream it's not posting my comments anymore uh oh time to log out and log back in again hmm. well somebody asked a question about this thing over to the left of my <laughs> laptop <laughs> so i'll fill time you got three minutes jody this is a 3d mouse <laughs> specifically this is the space mouse enterprise from 3d connection uh, it is not a requirement to run sketchup by any means i use it for these sessions because it allows me to do these nice subtle pans, rotates, and zooms, a little bit just nicer than what you'd see uh, if I was only using the mouse over here. It's, it's an interesting thing. I was actually talking to somebody about this the other day about, uh, somebody was talking about first-person video game navigation and how it makes them like feel nauseous. 
when they watch somebody else play, but it doesn't bother them when they play. And the issue is that uh, as I move through something in 3D space, if my brain's expecting it, like this in SketchUp, I know I'm gonna rotate to the right, I know I'm gonna rotate to the left, uh, I'm gonna zoom in, I'm gonna zoom out. If my brain's expecting it, then this is not disorienting necessarily. If you don't know I'm gonna do that, then seeing this on your screen can be a little bit shocking or, uh, or off-putting because it can be, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's can be disorienting. I tend to use the mouse because it forces me to move a little bit slower and the, the movements are more graceful. So that's why I use it. Again, not a requirement. Everything you need to do with zooming in SketchUp can be done with the three button mouse. Uh, it's a nice presentation tool though. So if you show your models to a lot of people, it's a good option there. And as a designer, it speeds up my design because I don't have to worry about zooming with this. This, this tool becomes just for uh, grabbing tools or making adjustments all the moving then gets assigned over here to my left hand. So make some, some use of this left hand. What, what, what else are you gonna do? So yeah, so those are some, some options. Okay, so I restarted Restream, but there's, I can see some questions that popped up in the midst of the, in the, on the actual <laughs> YouTube channel there. So maybe, maybe one of these, maybe over here, there'll be some good questions. Uh, 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 you just spoke about the mouse. Yep, just covered it. Um, Saeed's asking for you to make a demo about the robot rig. Maybe that could be a future video. Eh? Yeah, I don't think I ever did. I missed it. Oh, but you know what we did have? We did have uh, a video that maybe Jody can find again <laughs> for uh, <laughs> Rodrigo Oliveri Cersei uh, and his... Uh, so our, our skill builder around his his presentation we talked about how he set up his models he used a specific number of segments on his low poly models just for that so we actually do have a video on that uh, if you can find that that was a, that's a good question um gavin would like to know how you can if you can demonstrate how to copy and rotate on an opposing onto an opposing face sure Let's say, I'm gonna color this all white because this blue is uh, trying my brain. All right, so I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna draw a circle right here. It's all white with me. Ooh, nailed it. I'm gonna say, <laughs> I wanna put that circle, <laughs> same distance this edge over here. All I have to do is select the geometry, go to rotate, and get to the axes I wanna rotate along, which is the flat axis is blue. And I click right here, where do I wanna rotate from? Hit the modifier key, option. And I can bring this circle right around, boom, like that. I do this all the time for symmetric geometry too. So if I want that the same distance from this side over here, I can select it and I can hover till I find the midpoint. Click out on this edge, option, drag it around to the other side, boom, there I go. So hopefully that works. I use, I, it's funny because if I'm drawing symmetric geometry, I probably use rotate more often than I do any kind of mirror or anything like that. It's just an easy way to take stuff and, and put it on the opposite edge of something. Uh, Miguel's asking if you could show how to draw, how to do a sphere. I can. Let's come Good. over here. I'm going to use two tools, circle and follow me. So first circle I'm gonna draw is me on the ground. And now I'm gonna come over to the center and I'm gonna hit the green key to force my, my orientation vertical. I'm not gonna draw right here in the circle. I'm actually gonna go up and hover above and pull out a second circle like that. Now I'm gonna select the circle on the ground, say follow me and click on the first circle. And with that, I have a sphere. It's inside out, so I wanna triple click on it and say reverse face, but uh, that's all it takes. I've said before, you should be able to do that in less than 10 seconds. I think we called it a six second sphere, but- a Six second sphere, because it's all alliterative. Yeah, but I think- I mean, you could also honestly, say 16. I think it really took me eight seconds to do, and I used editing to fit, shorten up the one second at the beginning and end. Oh, here, let's see. Oh, there you go. You trimmed out the clicking. That's right, somebody time this. Ready, set, go. What 
Whoops. Well, without the whoops, that was pretty close, right? <laughs> yeah, that whoops really slowed you down. <laughs> well, not that. Well, we're talking about six seconds. A one second whoops is like one sixth of my time limit. Anyhow, okay, moving on. So, Isuru is asking if you could roughly show how to model the Bird's Nest Stadium. That, that sounds, do that in six seconds. I, I don't know what that is. So it's that cool looking thing in, it's in, where was that? Is it the one, were they building in China? I keep wanting to say it's in London, but I think it's actually, it's like they built it just for the Olympic, the last Olympics. Oh, why don't you throw a picture up on the forum in our uh, more Q&A live today again forum. Oh, where is this place? Yeah, it's okay. from Beijing. Yeah. Well, regardless of where it is, guys, I still don't know what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a bird's nest, obviously. People are putting in Beijing, Korea. <laughs> oh, well, in that case, I know what it looks like. Ping, it just comes right, right into your, into your right. brain. So, yeah, the trick is finding now a, a, good, a good angle. It kind of, I apologize to the designer, but... Some of these pictures, it kind of looks like a toilet seat. They should have called it the toilet seat stadium. No offense. Um, Brian on YouTube designed a house in SketchUp, including a basement. And he'd like to add landscaping like we have in the model used for prepping SketchUp files for layout. Just yeah. A, an open-ended can... question. So what I would what I would suggest doing if you have uh, SketchUp Pro is just uh, go check out your sandbox tools. It is so t I'm gonna say this again. It's time to clean out extensions. But in the sandbox tools, <laughs> what you can do is create a grid. I'm gonna do this just a super short demo here. But uh, sandbox tools lets you go in and set a grid. So first thing to do is set my grid spacing. So right now I'm drawing at 12. What's that gonna look like? That's, that works. So I'll go ahead and create a grid, and this would be the size of your lot. You don't have to make this real tight, super super fine mesh. You can actually make it pretty pretty open like that. Double click to enter the mesh, and then that's where you can use the Smooth tool. So what the Smooth tool lets you do is set a radius. Oops. Oh man, I'm in some. I'm in in. What am I in? No, that's right. So what this lets you do is grab a chunk of geometry and see, I, get the, I get this casual fall off to the edges of what I'm grabbing. So it's not going to let, I'm not going to create harsh, broken geometry. It's all going to be like this nice, smooth geometry uh, where the center of my selection is going to let me move and create that that's nice, smooth geometry. If you ever have a situation or a spot that you need to put more harsh geometry, so say I have some rocks sticking up right here something i want a little bit more not quite as much smoothness i want some more opportunity to make sharper edges or smaller protrusions i can come in here and i can click the add detail button i think it's that one and that'll take and make smaller geometry of that so i can come back to smooth then drop down to something significantly smaller and i can start moving that geometry that little geometry around uh, to make I said, whatever it is I have to add at that point. So maybe these are rocks sticking out of my, my uh, existing geometry. So yeah, I would say sandbox tools. Check out sandbox tools. Once you get all your geometry in there, triple click, go to soften and smooth edges and smooth it all out. And that's how. So I posted a. Oh, there it is. I posted a picture of the bird, bird's nest. Yeah. Hmm. All right, that's finished. That's an interesting looking thing. <laughs> All right, so here, here's my, my five minute bird nest. Is it circular or is it ovaloid? It looks ovaloid. Okay. I mean, if you click that link, that's literally a link to the 3D warehouse model. <laughs> That'll be easier. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I'm, that'd be cheating. Well, but it, at least you could then get seed and you That's could or, or, orbit around it. 
Too late. I've already started drawing stuff, Jody. I can't help myself. Okay. <laughs> so while you're drawing, uh, JDC is asking if the smooth tool only works in the Z axis. Um, you can. I think it works perpendicular to the the face to the mesh surface, right? Yeah. Right. So if I come in here and I grab smooth. Oops. That's going to only let me Miguel go vertical. Miguel, thanks for the sphere. Um, yeah. There we go. So, see that difference? So... Trying to find, I need to find, I need some more extreme geometry to work with. So I have the ability with shift to allow me to move perpendicular to a highlighted surface. Um, but yeah, normally it's normal to, it's vertical. So if I've ever had to pull something off to a weird geometry, my solution, I don't know if this is ideal or not, my solution is to take this Rotate it. Come in with smooth. Pull that vertically this way. And then I can go take that. So, um, but yeah, normally it's, it's vertical, but you can use the shift command to make it normal to a surface as you're moving it. Um, oh, so real quick, let's do this. It looks like I'm so making stuff up right now. Um, I'm going to say it's something like this. And then I'm going to put a half circle right here. This will be my starter geometry. And then we can deform this, grab this sphere, say, follow me with this. We get something like that. And then, I wonder if I can take that. So if I was looking at native tools, I mean, if I, if I had, if I used Fredo scale, I could come in and start making, denting some stuff, but, uh, Failing that with just native tools, I could start moving some pieces down like that. Shooting from the hip on this one, but. Yeah, so I could do something like that, which would give me, okay, actually this comes back in and has like a roof thing over it. I thought it jumped, dropped back down, but, so yeah, I could do, you could do something like that. I don't know. <laughs> Not the best bird, 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 bird nest? What was it called? Bird nest stadium? Uh, that's what it's called. Yeah. Yep. And not not the best bird nest, but it's uh, not bad considering how many seconds I spent on it. And how much uh, time you spent looking at it in the past. Yeah. Which the, is to say none. The times I turned my head to the right and looked at that one image. Based on that, uh, I'm not too upset. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Cohen asked, why do you always reverse the blue faces? Um. So it's not actually a requirement. Uh, the blue faces are the inside and the white faces are the outside of the mesh. So if this was going anywhere else besides inside SketchUp, this would be seen as the inside and potentially invisible, whereas this would be the outside face. So if I was to take like 
this right here, and I wanted to call this a solid. If I was to take that and make it a group, uh, it won't find it as a proper solid because it's inside out. So if I wanted to take this sphere and print it, um, I may have a problem taking this sphere to some slicers, the software that preps a geometry for printing because it doesn't see any exterior faces. So that's why it's generally bad to have it if I'm going to do any kind of exporting. If I'm going to go take it and render, if I was to take this landscape and I want to put it into a render and show it, some renderers see backside faces as invisible or black or all white or something other than uh, a textured surface. So if I take this into a rendering software, if I hit render, I might just get a blank sheet because it won't actually see that. I'd have to take it and then reverse that face to give me that white outward facing uh, surface. So people ask a lot, why, how come as soon as I draw a shape on the ground, why does it face down instead of face up? The assumption if I draw a surface on the ground like this is that my next step is going to be to pull it into 3D space. When I pull it into 3D space, that means that downward face is still facing white down uh, and that what was the outside is, still, is now the inside. So that's why as soon as you draw something on the ground, it shows up blue facing up because the assumption is that you're going to pull that up into 3D space. Yes. Okay, so Christian on Facebook said that they're planning to change their package license for their company. And it's basically they're looking at the difference between Pro and Studio and they're curious, what is Sapphira? Can you in a nutshell, give an overview of what Sapphira yeah. is? Yeah. Sapphira is about energy optimization of your model. So let's do things like daylight analysis, uh, uh, energy modeling, it lets you go in and take a building and, and optimize it for energy usage and performance. So it's performance design, basically. Um, if that's something that you do, then it is an extremely powerful tool. So if that's something you're interested, I do recommend you contact your salesman and uh, ask him to find more information about Sapphira. Sebastian asked this a little while ago. Uh, well, he suggested, uh, show us quick ways to do parallel lines and perpendicular lines. One key. So if I draw, I'm going to draw a couple lines, and these are going to be, I don't know what those are. Well, wow, man, nice. All right, so if I come in here, click right here, and I want to draw a line parallel to this, if I hover over it and then drop back, it'll turn magenta. If I grab over this one, come back, it'll turn magenta parallel to the edge right there. Now, if I hit the down arrow, it turn, stays magenta but turns bold. And now with the down arrow pressed, I can hit the down arrow again, and it will toggle between perpendicular to the, the selected edge or parallel and go back and forth by toggle by tapping the down arrow on the keyboard. Same thing here. So if I come up here again, I'll hover over this and come back here. Down arrow will lock it in. Down arrow again, whoops, will turn to parallel or perpendicular. All you need to know, just the down arrow. Nice. Uh, blended okay. RBLX Roblox wants to know if you do all of the SketchUp vids, but then he clarified and said the beginning SketchUp ones. I don't know if he means like the ones that are 20 years old or 15 oh. years old at this point, <laughs> or if he just means the <laughs> SketchUp for, for beginners. Yeah, so we have those uh, intro to SketchUp or welcome to Sketch. I, I can't remember what the name, what is the name of those? Those four, uh, they're like, what, six, seven years old now? That was not me. Um, is, is that one of the Tysons? I think they're Matt, actually. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. That was actually a, uh, a guy who was hired to be part of the learning team, and he was a videographer, and he did uh, those first four welcome. They're like less than 10 minutes each. Welcome to SketchUp. Just covers the basics. That was uh, someone named Matt. If you go into our learn.sketchup, which is our SketchUp uh, campus, that's actually Tyson and Eric do those. The videos I am responsible for are the short form videos we release on YouTube, things like the weekly skill builders or these live streams. Um, well, so this is one of those we don't really answer, one of those questions we don't answer, but Danny's asking if we're developing an app mm -hmm. for iPad, iPad Pro. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> That's, again, wait, let me um, get the answer again. 
Um, yeah, Jody and I work in the world of released software, so we really don't have much insight on, on where we're going. And unfortunately, if we did, we would not be at liberty to say because we are told by our uh, powers that be, the powers that be, that we are not to talk about and release software because we're a publicly traded company and we honor that because we like working where we work. So yeah. Yeah, because we get to work from home right now. That's kind of cool. That's true. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna sword. throw one in here. I actually like Sebastian was making a comment about rigging, and so years ago, like literally 12 years ago, so years long time ago, there's this guy Justin Chin is his name, but he went by Monster Zero, and he was making oh. a comic book in SketchUp, and so mm -hmm. he actually had figured out, and he even has this great video on rigging basically posing a character in, in the model, like shows the way he does it. And he's like, and he's got several really good, they're only, he only has 190 subscribers, but he's got, uh, let's see, two dozen videos. Wow. Uh, and most of those are SketchUp. Uh, okay, that's only eight of those are SketchUp, 10 of those are SketchUp, but they're just some amazing stuff. I'm actually gonna, I'm just gonna post it into the thread. Cause if you yeah, go for it. are trying to pose characters, um, or just, I don't know, his stuff's just inspiring to look at. And it blows me away because he was doing this basically in SketchUp 7. Wow. That's really so, cool. Yeah. So I just posted it. So he has he has some stuff on doing rigging or posing. And then he also has some of just sort of speed building an actual character, which is pretty, pretty amazing. That's very cool. So anyway, check him out. I encourage you. That's uh, awesome. And past that, I don't have many questions left. No, it's okay. We we uh, hit the two hour, and this is when we start to run dry anyhow. So <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> We're good. Yeah. And, and Andy asked what happened to the previous co-host, uh, the one that was around when you modeled the bobsled. And oh, it's probably oh. worth mentioning that we actually have to fight for this position, and he's dead now. That's right. right? It was it was a Spar true Spartacus moment. Two men enter, one man leave. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, Josh is is alive and well and with us. Josh focuses primarily on a lot of our face-to-face uh, -face training. So he does uh, some enterprise tra training with our bigger customers. He uh, was a big part of our boot camp that we went around with this summer. So he's gotten a chance to focus on, that's kind of his, his core interest has always been in the training part. Um, and I have just gotten kind of uh, left here in the content creation world where uh, you guys said you want to see more live streams. So, that's how it's worked. And right now, he's locked in his house in Boulder. So he's like eight miles that way. Yeah, I'm posting pictures of the wildlife that apparently make their way right past. I don't get much wildlife in my, my neighborhood or yard. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Yeah, so That's we right. can, so questions are starting to trickle in a little bit, but. <clears throat> well, hey, we can wrap it. That's okay. Um, oh, here's a good question, though. Gavin Schofield is asking, he's designing a workbench with multiple holes and doesn't want to push in or out 200 holes. Let me show you something. Let's say, I'm going to make extreme, right? I'm going to come in here. I'm going to put a circle right here. Manus has a question too when you're done with that one. All right, here, we're going to, I'm going to make two copies of this. So if I come in here and I push this up and I say, I'm going to put a circle right here and then I want to pull that circle down and I want that to repeat a whole bunch of times. You can grab this option, copy it, 12X. But the problem, and this is probably what you're talking about, you have to come in here sometimes. It depends on the geometry. to break the geometry, delete that top and bottom. Pain in the butt, don't want to do it. Got it. So what I would suggest instead is when you still have a 2D face, come in here and do it, do it now instead. So if I come in and put my circle in there once. I'll take that, copy it, uh, we'll go this way, and say divide that by 15, and then I'll take all those circles, and I'll go up here, and say divide that by 10. All right, so now I would still have to come through and delete all these faces, or I can select just the surface I wanna keep, copy it over here, and look at that. Now I have that surface with no holes. Now if I take that and drag it to the depth of my workbench, I'm done. So at that point, all the holes are cut, 
way easier to do it in the 2D and then pull it to 3D than it is to go cut those holes out over and over again. Failing that, you could make a single solid tool with a bunch of holes like a cutter that you could drop down into it and use solid tools to bore it out, but I would still think that the 2D shape would be much easier. That's, that's a good answer. Number one answer. All right. In fact, Gavin called you a genius for that. Eh, that's a stretch. We should probably call it right now. Go out on a high note. There's still a chance <laughs> okay. I'll screw stuff up if I answer one more question. I'm out. Click. <laughs> um, okay, so Manus asked this. He said, how do we start a surface with different levels, say topographical, and then put a home in it? So basically, it sounds like he wants to stamp yep. a model into a, into a topo. All right, let's say this right or here. Into terrain is a surface I want to put in here. Let's say I want to put it right there. I want to stamp that straight down. Fortunately, we have a tool for that. So if I come back over here to my sandbox tools, over over where? Where now? All right. Sandbox tools. <laughs> Look, I, haven't, I haven't actually been looking at the screen when you're pulling up that 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 menu. Oh man. Reset. It's about time to clean it up. That's right. And now I can just stamp that right down into that surface. Yeah, I should definitely Ooh. call it now. <laughs> yeah. Mic drop. Mic drop, as YouTube said. And um, walk off stage. Okay. Transom through. Transom through one, one quick one. And he said, you mentioned something okay. in a previous live stream about making a component and it's saving two components, but not in the model. Is there a styles button for that or something? As soon as you make a component, a... it's just saved into components. So if I grab this thing right here, I'm going to triple click this and make it a new component. Uh, what was it? My bench top. And as soon as I create it, right when I do that, it goes into my components and model. So there it is right there. So even if I come in here and I delete it, it's still in the model as part of my components. So I grab it at any time and bring it right back in. That's just how it functions. If you create a component, that goes into your in-model components. You don't have to do anything special. If you want to get it out of the model, that's a little more work because that's where I have to come onto a component, right click, save as, and save that component as a separate SketchUp model. So that would be the way to do it. Um, so Manos actually was saying he wanted to make the terrain. Did you have any skill builders about doing, like creating terrain in the, in the sandbox tool? Um, yes. I'm looking. <laughs> yes. I see how to make a bag of chips. Oh, close. Which I um, guess is just like terrain. Yeah, we actually have uh, some Sandbox Tools videos coming out this week and next week uh, that will cover some okay. of the basics of using SketchUp tools, which I gave you guys a sneak peek to. Um, but if you're, it, it depends on what you're asking. If you're trying to follow like topographical lines, then that's a separate process of using from contours. If you're just using the Smooth tool, then uh, basically what I showed is kind of it. So. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of, it depends on that question. So this, this, well, I'm, wasn't, so I'm not sure if you're here, Manos, but this, this whole thing was just made just using, uh, the smooth tool in, uh, sandbox tools. So this is all just real quick, super quick sandbox tools. But otherwise doing a search for SketchUp and, uh, from contours on YouTube probably get you... Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, that should get you something. I'm trying to remember what we've put out before. I feel like Sandbox Tools has been neglected as far as video content. That's why I was trying to make a couple of videos of it. Andy said that Nick Sonder had a video on contours and laying out buildings. Okay. And getting volume amounts. So maybe that's the place to go. That's out there. Cool. Well, Sweet. kind of feeling like we're there. All right, that's another one in the books. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, other than that, uh, well, I guess you just gotta expect one brain fart per video, apparently, that's how I run. <laughs> Wait, which, 
which one was the brain brain fart? This time, which about that which time texturing the uh, curved <laughs> surface? Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Anyhow, so Gary had commented this earlier. He's getting geometry that's showing through, and I, I I'm not sure if it's Z fighting or if it's something else, but. Uh, he said that he was running into an issue with geometry showing through geometry as you zoom further away from it. Mm -hmm. It sounds like basically he was working really, with a really thin object. Yeah, if you if you have something real real thin like this, relative, it's, and this is all relative. Uh, if I make this a group, and then I will draw another smaller rectangle, make that a group, and then I will drop that vertically whoops, vertically to the other side. So that's underneath. Um, as I get further and further and further away, it eventually peeks through because those faces relative to how far you are from the camera are getting closer and closer and closer together. So uh, there's not a whole lot to be done about that bleed through other than uh, that's where you could get into using tags. If this is an interior thing and you're on the exterior, turn that tag off so you don't see it. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, if you if you have real thin materials relative to how big your model is or how far your that material is from your camera, you will get a little bit of bleed through like that depending on, on how you have it modeled. So um do we have plans for Wednesday Wednesday yet? Have you unveiled them anywhere? I liked the idea that you and I were just talking about before. So I'll, let's let's bounce this off of 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 yous guys, all yous. Um, we've had, uh, no, you know what, let's make it a surprise. Yes, we do. Okay. Come Ooh. back on Wednesday and find out. Oh, <laughs> I can't wait to come back. <laughs> you you better believe you can't. That, that didn't come oh yeah, right. you wanna plug the plug the challenge one last time? Yeah, one last time, let's, let's, uh, let's take a look over at this real quick. Um, we are doing a new challenge. Uh, it's right here. Over on our forum, if you go to forums.sketchup.com, finish this house challenge. We have a model available through the 3D warehouse called Finish This House. And what it is, is a very general, very basic shape that could be a structure of some sort. And we're asking you to finish it off using SketchUp. So that means landscape, exterior, interior, the whole thing. Go make this into something. This could be a beautiful residence. Residence? Why did I, I put the <laughs> emphasis on the wrong Axies. syllable? <laughs> this could be your own, a beautiful residence. This could be a under the sea house. This could be whatever you want it to be. You take this and make it into something awesome. Post it on 3D Warehouse and put it in the appropriate uh, forum topic linked in the instructions. And uh, we'll come back on Friday and check out what everybody's done. So it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, it should be a good time, just a fun way for us to all hang out together, work on the same thing, and then share what we did. So it's, uh, it, it'll be kind of neat. Check that out. We don't have, uh, I'm just saying, we point this out right now, we don't have a specific day time that this is going to be over either. This is just kind of a... For the foreseeable future, we're just going to keep running this and people can keep doing it. So, uh, Got a couple questions. Can we add extra stuff like extra floor? You can. What we're asking is that this main shape, this, the, this course section, be identifiable in your model. So when you look at it, don't go in and build a whole bunch of walls outside of that and now you have a whole new shape. We should be able to pick out this shape in your model. So if you want to add, like somebody asked, on, uh, on here, can I put uh, screen walls on the outside, like to make a screened in porch? Sure, go for it. Want to put a spire on the top, something like that? That's awesome. But make sure this is the core of what you're building. Uh, Manos is, he's asked us a couple of times. I think he wants to try and get this before we before we take off. All right. About how to start a start a surface with different levels, like basically start creating terrain from a topo. So could you make just like a, a simple like three tier topo and show how that works or something? Um, you see his question there? We do have a video on that. Uh, okay. Let me see or wait till tomorrow. <laughs> the sandbox tool It'll video will be, video be up tomorrow. tomorrow or tomorrow at two a.m. Um, otherwise, there was a skill builder. 
And we actually did a live stream on uh, Landscape as well. And there's an entire course on Landscape on Learn. So there is quite a few places you can go do that. I don't have a topo Perfect. lines to start from, so it's, it's kind of what I would create would be janky at best. Yeah. Uh, Transom and YouTube are both on board for Japanese joinery session, and I also would be okay. on board for that. Although I feel like, like Aaron, well, that could be that an interesting when. In, no, I know what that is. Very, no, I, very it's not about me. And, and those are always the, uh, the awesome ones. I can. I'll show you. I'll show you too many videos or pictures okay. later. Send some images over. All right, we'll <laughs> add that to the list for sure. Yeah. Um, Michael's asking about. Uh, rounded corners. If you go to our YouTube channel and look at videos, I made a rounded cube using only native tools maybe three week, three or four weeks ago. So it's it's right there. Actually, you you did it two hours ago too. That was like yeah. our opening question. <laughs> it was just recent too. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much for showing up, Jody. Thanks. I'm not, oh, I'm not thanking you anymore. Thank you guys for hanging out with me and Jody. You're not a guest anymore. You're you're a regular. So you get that. Uh. Yeah. Fine. Now I'm just part of the scenery. <laughs> uh, but thank you guys for hanging out with us. Uh, thanks for all the questions. This was awesome. Uh, appreciate you guys hanging out with us. And uh, come back on Wednesday. We'll be building something together. I will get plans up and into the forum between now and then. So you can actually follow along with whatever it is we build. And then come back on Friday. Friday is our big build where we build something. Something. I don't even know what something's going to be yet. We need to go figure out that out today too. But uh, thank you so much. And... Uh, we will talk to you guys later. See you guys.